Hi, everybody. Well, I have so thoroughly enjoyed this entire day meeting everybody, and I want to really thank you all. It, it's so incredible that you've taken this time to put yourself in front of some of the women who I've heard speak today to help advance your careers. It's just, there's no better way to learn and catapult your career forward. I'm talking today about building your career and the power of intention. And you know, I was thinking about it when I was putting together this talk that a career and building a career is really, it's like life. It's, it's, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, the things I'm going to share with you today took 25 years to really learn to be able to share with you. And that, you know, it's a step by step that you take to build your career and to build your life. But I think it's really important to be intentional about what direction do you want to go? Because it's easy to take a lot of circuitous routes that maybe aren't taking you into the direction that you, you really want to go. I also look at building your career like building wealth or a bank account. You put a quarter in here, you put $100 in there, and soon you've got this incredible wealth, right? So I, I want to share a story. When um, I started my career in the arts, I was an actress, and I wanted to write a one-woman play. And I went to undergraduate school in theater, but I wanted to work with this incredible mentor. His name was Tony Montanaro. And he worked with a group of what I call itinerant performers, jugglers and acrobats, musicians, dancers. And I was working with all of them, and I wanted to just write a one-woman play. So I remember working with him, putting material together, and I was just eager to get on with my career. And I remember going up to Tony, and I said, um, I was pretty clumsy at the time, and I worked with all these people who were so beautifully fluid in their movement. And I said, you know, Tony, the only thing is, hey, I want to get on with my career, but, uh, but I really feel clumsy. And he goes, oh, baby, you should go dance for a couple years. I, but I said, well, <laughs> what about my career? He goes, it's part of building your career, building the foundation for your career. He said, he said go dance for two years. Well, he was 50 years older than me, and he was always right. So I went and I danced. And I went to the Ohio State University. Are you here? Who was it that, yes, there we go, Jen. And they had a great dance program and I danced. But I'm sure as many of you can relate, I needed to make a living. And um, I, when I had worked with these itinerant performers, I had learned to juggle. And I, I created a little children's show. I juggled balls and I juggled clubs and told stories and walked on my hands, anything to the amusement of the kids. So I would do birthday parties and perform sometime, but I was studying dance, so I also waitressed. And um, I was a novice runner, and I was uh, running and hurt my knee, and I couldn't work long shifts for a while, and I couldn't dance, so I had to take a little time off. And I thought, how am I going to make money to get by? And it was about this time of year the end of June and the 4th of July was coming and I thought, you know what? My friends, a lot of them were street performers and they made a lot of money performing in places like Faneuil Hall and Boston and other places where tourists went. And I thought, I can juggle. And I was pretty bold. So I thought, I am gonna go to this 4th of July celebration and I'm gonna take my balls and my top hat tricks and off I went. I drove my car ready for the 4th of July so I could pass the hat parked my car way out on the outskirts, and I went in, and there was a few people gathered, and I started my little top hat tricks, and I juggled balls, and the claw, and people were responding. They were, they were clapping, and they were putting money in my hat. So I would put it to my little zipper bag and put it over there, and then I would start again, and, I'd, and more people were gathering. And so up on the hills, and, and more and more people, there must have been 300. And so I'm out there feeling pretty confident, thinking, you know, maybe I can give up waitressing. And I'm juggling, and a couple little tricks under the leg, behind the back. And I didn't tell you this. I also thought I knew how to do fire clubs. Now, I wasn't great at it, but I could do what is called a normal three-pass cascade. And when I did it for the kids, they loved it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do that. And I bring out the fire sticks. And they're like, yay, baby. And I'm talking back and forth. I'm just feeling super confident. And I'm throwing the sticks and back to the balls and the clubs. More money. It's filling up. I won't have to work in waitressing for months. And so it's, it's starting to get a little darker. And more people are gathering. And I continue on. And I'm doing my fire clubs. Oops, one dropped. Well, that happens, and you pick it up, and you go on. And, I, da, 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 one, and then one, two, drop. 
And it was at that moment <laughs> I realized I had never rehearsed when it started getting dark. And it was getting dark outside, and there were black handles. So what do you do? I pick them up again, <laughs> and I just da 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 and one, two again. And I am just frozen. And way in the back, I hear, boo, boo. I'm like a deer in the headlights. But like any good performer, I pick them up again. And I just da, 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 da again, boom, boom. Boo, 30, 40, 50, 40, boo, go home. I am just frozen, and suddenly this large man comes to my side, muscular with a green beret. I thought I was being arrested for performing so badly. <laughs> and he said, how may I help you? And I said, um, um, can you walk me to my car, carry my money, I really need it. And there I go limping off, people boo, boo, oh my gosh, and I'm ba finally back to the, the parking lot, and there's people, the fireworks have started. And there's people all over the parking lot. They're sitting on my car. They're sitting on other people's car. And I go up timidly to this one woman and I said, um, could, you, could you please get off my car? I have to leave. The fireworks have started, bitch. <laughs> nice crowd. <laughs> so my muscular green beret guy gives her a stern look and they all spread out. And I go driving out, parting people like cattle on the road. And I wave to him a thank you. A, gracious, filled with gratitude, and he winks at me, telling me, you're safe. I remember going home just <laughs> sodden, just, just so discouraged, but I wasn't defeated. I remember having this very aha moment where I thought, if I can survive that humiliation, <laughs> I can survive anything. And that's the decision that I made that day. And it was really, really a defining moment for everything that I did moving forward. You do not have to be perfect. You can make mistakes. And my teacher said this to me. Well, it's finding the gift. What was the gift in that situation? What was the gift in going to Ohio State? Not only that, I had to waitress. Who knew in running a special event venue? All that I learned, you know, in the hospitality business, waitressing, I use in my business now. The gift. But my teacher also said, you can't get there, your career, from here. You have to go step by step by step by step and build it. And all those little steps, everything, I hope you remember that when you stumble and fall, because you will. But that's where you learn the really, really good stuff. Not when people are clapping and think you're the greatest. There's a wonderful movie called, you might have seen it, called The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. Have you seen that? There's a line in it where, where they say, everything will be all right in the end. And if it's not all right yet, trust me, it's not the end. And they have another line where they say, the person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing. So go out and risk it. And if you forget this, give me a call on the telephone and I'll remind you, risk it. So let's talk about mining your assets, what you're good at. Moving beyond status quo. Who here in this room wants to be status quo? I didn't think so. I don't think you'd be at a conference like this if you want to be status quo. I don't know about you, but I want to be extraordinary. I don't want to be ordinary. I want to be extraordinary. So it's really looking at personal excellence. When I work with my team and my company, the servers, you know, how do you explore personal excellence? And it's not to please me, the boss. It's not to please the client, but personal excellence for yourself. So I say to the servers, I have one server who's studying to be a surgeon, another an attorney, a variety of different, they're going to college. But I said, get in the practice of, as you're doing this job, get really good at being 110% there, present, utilizing all your skills to develop the habit for when you're, you know, about to go uh, operate on somebody or a legal um, situation. And you know, everyone talks about superwoman. I think superwoman to me is, being the best at what you're passionate about as you move into your career. Intentional about it. You can't be good at everything. I learned in my business that 
I have to surround myself with people who are just incredible, better than me at many, 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 many things. I'll be good at what I'm, I want to be super woman, woman at what I'm good at and let them excel at what they're good at. So it's really exercising your potential. And I like to look at what are the possibilities? I call it possibility thinking. You know, if it could work, what would it look like? But I think it's really important. Would you agree with this? You've got to surround yourself with the right people. I'm hearing a lot of, the, a lot of what the women were talking about today. We're saying a lot of the same things. You're really only as good as the people you have around you. So really, you know, consider who do you hang out with? And what's your story? I want to create a television show. What's your story? You know, I want to hear it's, it's stories of people and how they got to where they are. What's your brand? Now, at Carl House, my venue, we had a logo, we have a look, but the brand is more than just a logo. It's the way you do things in your business. I'm very preferential. I'm paid to have preferences as, as, a, as, a, as a boss, as, as a leader in my organization. I'm very preferential about how my team dresses. We deal with brides. We produce 100 plus uh, weddings a year. How they dress, how they speak. Now, I'm from up north, and up north we all say, hey, you guys, guys. And I said, you know what? We're not going to use that anymore here. We're dealing with brides. They're women. So let's say ladies. Or we're in the south. I own an antebellum style home. Let's say y'all. So I, I learned how to say y'all, even though I'm a Yankee transplant. We say y'all. Hey, y'all. So it's really being preferential about how you do things in your company. Um, uh, now, if I had a skateboarding company, it would be different. If I had a skateboarding company, we would all, you know, skate to the door to greet our guests. We'd wear those cute little skorts and uh, have green nail polish. If we had long hair, we'd put it in ponytails. We'd say, yo, a lot. But I don't have a skateboarding company. I have a special event venue. There's a, there's a store, uh, a grocery store in the town where I live, and I won't name it. I love to grocery shop when I have time. I like strolling up the aisles, thinking of, you know, the dinner I'll make or friends that I'll have over. I love to entertain. But I have great experience in this, in this grocery store until I get to the checkout counter. So a couple weeks ago, I get to the checkout counter. There's this young woman, and she's just on her one hip, and she's... Chewing gum. And I walk up. She's got her nail polishes all chipped. It's not put together at all, like she barely combed her hair. And I initiate the conversation. I go, hi, how are you? Ugh, I can't wait till I go home. I said, wow, how long have you been here? Nine o'clock. No, it was two in the afternoon. And uh, I said, well, yeah, I could feel the mother and the, the parent and the boss in me just, you know, about to burst. And I said, well, it sure is lucky that you have a job. And she goes, well, I hope I, I win the lottery. I said, well, what would you do if you won the lottery? Well, I'd probably hang out at home. I don't know, buy a, a new car or something. She shoves me off. She must have been hired for being very quick at ringing things up. So I just spent $203 and she doesn't say thank you. She doesn't give me time to put my credit card. But I mean, this, she's a frontline person in, my org, in that, that organization, and she's ruined my experience. Now, the ladies in the bakery, they're great. Hey, BB, how are you? Can we carry the cake out? You know, what are you going to get this week? I love coming to the bakery. In fact, I eat more cakes now because they're so nice to me. <laughs> so, what's your brand? What's your brand? And, you know, with that, what's your personal brand? Now, I'm, I'm upset at the company because they should be coaching her to have a consistency within that company. But she should, she should be looking at her, if, if her personal brand is that, she doesn't know. I recruit everywhere I go. When I see good talent, they go, hey, where are you working? No, no, here's my card. Why don't you call my HR company? You know, I'm always recruiting. And she blew it. I don't know why I'd, I'd hire her. It'd be too much to work. But, you're, you're, you know, are you, are you the person you want to meet? I ask myself sometimes, hmm, would I date myself? Huh. <laughs> Depends on the week, you know. So how do you present? Because the way you do anything is the way you do everything. If you're slovenly and inconsistent at home, guess what? I bet you are at work too. If you are meticulous and accountable at home, I bet you're the same way at work. So where do you practice? Where do you practice? Because when you show up, you make a difference, all right? And, you know, I think it's important to fire the people in your life who aren't working for you. You've only got so much time. And if somebody isn't working, you might just respectfully set them free. 
fire them. All right? Now, you can do it nicely. All right, let's talk about paying your dues, navigating the hard stuff. Frankly, I think the hard stuff is an attitude. I just, I'm sending a book that I'm writing. Um, it's called Build Your Business, B.B. Webb's Notes from the High Wire. It's everything I've learned in the last 11 years of business. I'm sending it to the editor next Monday. And when I look back at all the experiences, it's the hard stuff that taught me how to be a better businesswoman. It's the hard stuff. And I think we have to change our attitude instead of, oh, here comes another, you know, travesty to go, thank you. Here comes a hard one. Let me see how good I am. I think it's an attitude. And, and this whole thing of paying your dues, I don't, I, you know, I've been in business a long time. I've been on the planet a long time. I still pay dues. And to me, paying dues is doing free things or, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to develop a new product. You know, you give a lot of stuff, but you, you pay it forward all the time. There's a, if you're coming to the cocktail party, there's a young man who's going to be playing piano. I met him when he was six or seven, when I had a television show, and he was a young pianist. Well, he has logged in over 1,500 hours of community service playing the piano. But from that, the relationships he's built with the help of his mother, who's a dear friend of mine, he's now playing at the White House this year, and he's 15 years old. So the more you give, the more you get. The more you give, the more you get. Just keep giving, 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 giving. And, you know, with the hard stuff, my best friend and I, her name's Lulu, and, and we have a little pact. If something awful happens, ugh, we give each other one solid day. We look at the watch. Okay, you got 24 hours. Bitch, moan, complain, act like a victim, whatever. And then after that 24 hours, you're working on solutions. You work on a solution and you change your attitude. Because I'm not going to answer all that. Because you have to grieve it. It's upsetting. We can't pretend all oh, that, you know, when bad stuff happens. You need time to vent and grieve or whatever. But then what leaders do, and, you know, the na navigating the hard stuff, not everybody's meant to be a leader. This isn't a fit for everybody. But I know I'd make a terrible employee. I know I'm supposed to be a leader. And I've got, I've got, I can, I can handle it. There's times you think you can't, but... You know, test yourselves, and you'll find out if it's a right fit for you or not. So claim what you want in your life, this being intentional. I want to tell you a story. When I was opening my venue, Carl House, I, you know, I was an artist, and I didn't know what I didn't know, but I came into ownership of this beautiful old home, and I had this, I actually heard a voice when I was there, that, that you know, this would make a great place for people to gather and have party, parties. Well, my partner at the time and I were going to borrow a whole bunch of uh, money. I, I researched what other venues were doing. I knew I needed to build a ballroom, do the grounds. You know, all of a sudden we're getting into the millions of loan dollars. At any rate, the vision was clear, but I knew that right away loan payment waits for no one. So I knew I had to start selling the venue right away. And so I put up a representative website because the construction wasn't done yet, but I had pictures of brides and food and all kinds of things. And brides would come up and I'd say, it's not quite done. And they'd come up and they'd see a big mud pit. And I'd say, oh, I have a vision. I have a vision. Trust me. Because my word is good. And they trusted me. Well, that spring, I didn't know that we would have the worst torrential rains ever, ever, ever. And construction was slowed. And... Um, I was also having trouble getting the second part of my very, 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 very big loan that I needed to finish the construction. And on top of that, my marriage was falling apart. And I just remember being just consumed with this doubt and fear and angst. And people would come up to me and go, you're never going to open on time. You're going to have to reschedule the, br the brides. But let me tell you, rescheduling a bride is like blasphemy. You did is not done. <laughs> So I just realized I had to move forward as if I would be successful. And I put blinders on. People would come up and all their negative, I'd be like, blah, 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 la, 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 not listening to you. And I just said, I'm just, I, I, can't, I can't allow one little ounce of doubt. If it creeped in, everything would fall apart. And I was just like this. And I opened on time, but a month before opening, well, you know, I had to ask if it could work, what would it look like? But there was mud in the front. There was the back. This was supposed to be a, a, a bridal pathway. This is a month out. This is the ballroom two months out. You know, and I'm saying, no, trust me, trust me. And inside I'm going, okay, please God, please God, please God, and moving forward as if. But I had in my mind what I wanted. I had in mind 
the sign and what it would look like and the branding and what, what the gardens would look like and, and the pathway going to the house. I envisioned as well what the ballroom would look like with beautiful linens and flowers and that when people were gathered inside in the beautiful staircase, what that would look like. I would, I would meditate on this every day and people waving from the staircase, brides and grooms or saying their vows in front of the fireplace walking in the outside ceremony gardens and saying, I do, kissing under the weeping willow tree that wasn't yet planted. <laughs> you can't create what you don't dream of. So be really clear about what your intentions are. And don't think small, think big. This is a big one. But this gave me a whole renewed faith in the power uh, that I had and that you have for creating what you want in your life. Or I say, universe, God, this or better. Because heaven forbid I, you know, call in something that's limiting. I might not know how good good is. I like to ask them, how good is good? So mapping your plan for success. Priorities are what you spend or invest your time in. You know how we all say things like, well, it's my priority to work out five days a week. And we work out three. Now, nothing's wrong with working out three, but if you're not working out five, it's not a priority. It's not bad. I'm, I have a book deadline, and I've been working on it really hard for three months, and a lot of other things have fallen by the wayside. But I'll get back to them. You can't do everything all at once. But I think you need to look and choose and pick, what's my priority right now? I have a dog named Buddy. Something happens to him, that's my priority. I make sure he's fed every day. People have children, you know, that's their priority. But you have to pick and choose. Not everything can be a priority. They're what you invest your time on. And I think it's key to remember, and this is challenging for me at times, remembering what you know when the challenges come. Remembering what you know. You know you read a book sometimes and you read a passage. You go, oh, I knew that. Oh, I knew that. Oh, yeah, I just forgot. I forgot. It wasn't on my radar. Well, let me tell you another story. Uh, I, um, I take a personal growth sojourn every year. And it was a few years back just as the economy was shifting. And I, um, I decided to go to France. To, for the longest time I was ever away, three weeks, to do this workshop with this awesome mentor and people just to expand my horizons in a variety of ways. And at any rate, I had a great time and I came back, you know, my team was handling everything and I came back to a $42,000 septic issue on my property during our busiest time. Five events on a weekend, almost shut me down. On top of that, uh, I realized it was the end of the month, we need $120,000 to break even every month and we only had 20. The bank where I had my big loan was getting rid of all their loans in the hospitality business and in Georgia, and I was buying 30 acres behind my place, and my partner at the time defaulted, so I had to either lose all the land I'd been paying for or find a way to pay for it. And then to top that all off, I had another project going, and I was being ridiculously sued over a miscommunication. I was a little stressed. So I did what I typically do. I'd worked an event the night before and I got up Sunday morning. It was thundering and lightning outside. When I did what I typically do, I got up, I fed all my animals, got a cup of coffee and I'm back in my bed. And I am just thinking, you know, what am I gonna do? And I'm working away and how am I gonna figure this out? And my dog, one of my dogs, Ernie, loves me and I love him and he likes to be close to mom. Well, he's outside my door window when I'm working away and I can feel this tension and, and it's starting to rain with the thunder and, and he's getting rained on. Now he has a big, beautiful covered porch with dog cushions and everything you could ever want, but he wants to be close to me. And I'm, I'm working, I could feel this, I could feel this anger, but no, it wasn't anger. I think anger is healthy. This was rage. <laughs> and rage to me is hopeless, helpless, and powerless. And I am working away and I look over and I said, Ernie, get out of the rain, you idiot. Now, I do not talk to my animals that way. 
So I don't know who this woman was that was showing up, but I am working away and I'm about losing and I throw the computer down on the bed and I go out to the other room and I open up the door and there's Ernie, of course he comes around. And I just start yelling and rah, rah, rah. Ernie, poor Ernie's looking at me like, what the heck? Do I? I'm, I'm cussing, I grew up with brothers, I know every cuss word under the sun. And I am, ah! and then I, I, I fortunately come inside to save Ernie and, and I'm, I'm pacing back and forth. I'm thinking, I don't, I don't know what else to do. I am out of ideas. I, I have all these people who are depending on me, employees and clients and, oh God, please help me. I am so lost. I do not know what to do. Help me. <laughs> and the phone rang. <laughs> Now, I have got one neighbor who lives way over there and one neighbor who lives way over there because I live out in the forest. They're the only two people who have my phone number, my landline number, and the, the, the alarm company. And I answer the phone. Hello, this is BB. <laughs> hey, BB, honey, this is Carol, your neighbor. Everything all right over there? Oh. I'm so embarrassed. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, Carol, I, I'm sorry. I, w I was just, um, I was frustrated with Ernie and, oh, honey, that's okay, sweetheart. We just, we heard just a bunch of yelling and screaming. You just blow off steam. Oh, Carol, I'm, I'm, I'm so, 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 so sorry about my bad language. Oh, honey. <laughs> All we heard was a bunch of screaming and a bunch of thunder. No worries, sweetheart. Hey, honey, we're here if you need us. Just call. A huge light bulb went off. <sighs> we're here if you need us. Just call. And I just realized at that moment, I was just, my, my focus was entirely in the wrong direction. I was focusing on the fear and I was focusing on the problem and I was focusing on what I couldn't do instead of asking for help, reaching out to the relationships I had, you know, knowing that there's a solution there if I would just quiet down my, you know, crazy mind at the time. Within a month, I renegotiated with the bank to extend my current loan until I could find another bank. I found another bank who would give me a short-term loan to see me through this financial crunch. And you know, it was interesting, people would come up to me and say, BB, you are not gonna get a loan in this economic climate, are you kidding? And I remember thinking, and you can relate to this, why in heaven's name would I ever set a goal with the thought of not achieving it? How preposterous would that be? I got the loan. My lawsuit was handled in mediation, and it worked out. Business is about relationships. And I just, again, congratulate you for being here. It's about who you meet, who you know, paying it forward, giving to others, letting them give to you, because doesn't it feel good to give to people and help people? Yeah? Yeah. So, in closing, play to your passion. I call it your twirl. When I was a little girl, I used to twirl. And whenever I twirl, I felt like I was in my power and I just in joyful spot. Play to your passion. What do you love? Find other people who are good at the things that you're not good at. Play to your passion. You know what? You're powerful. You are so much more powerful, I bet, than you know that you are. And anything that you focus on, if you want it badly enough, you'll get it or better. And you make a difference. Just by showing up in a room, you make a difference. What kind of difference do you want to make when you show up? So here's your challenge. Who can you meet to share support with? to share ideas with, to discover your personal brand. What is it? What's your personal brand? To create your intentions together, discover your personal brand and find your twirl. And once you have found your twirl, go ahead and help somebody else find theirs. It's been wonderful being with you. Thank you so much, everybody.